1976, a student at Texas A&M University was given a simple task, to feed the snakes. Thinking it didn't matter what kind of rodent the predators ate, the student offered a diamondback rattlesnake the first rat he came across. But after a lightning-fast bite, the rat just kept sitting there as if nothing happened. It was really lucky for a snake, because an encounter with this rodent could be fatal for the serpent. What do scientists do when they stumble across something unusual? Recreate the phenomenon in a controlled experiment, of course. They did indeed place rodents, a representative of the wood rat species, next to the snakes again. And they found out that small furry animals are not only immune to rattlesnake venom, the wood rats went one step further. Sometimes they would respond by scratching and biting the snakes to death. For these rodents, immunity to snake venom is like a first aid kit in a car. You hope you won't need it, but when push comes to shove, it can save your life. However, unlike a first aid kit, immunity to venom comes at a price. Yes, the cost of some meds sometimes seems too high, but hey, in order to make your body immune to venom, you have to die. When you get down to it, things don't seem so absurd. Small doses of toxins injected into the human body gradually teach it to resist it, and the toxin is not effective anymore. But animals cannot milk a snake to make an injection or even call emergency services if something goes wrong. All they have to do is develop immunity, gradually, from generation to generation. This is how natural selection works. If you survive the attack of a venomous snake, you and your offspring have an advantage. Welcome to the next level. However, there is an easier way, literally a cheat code in a world full of snakes. You can eat poisonous insects, just like poison dart frogs, which are sometimes called one of the most poisonous animals on the planet. That being said, the secret of their incredibly powerful toxin lies only in their diet. Scientists believe that poison dart frogs get their poison from certain arthropods and insects they hunt. Insects accumulate poison to defend themselves, acquiring it from plants, which most likely also became poisonous to protect themselves. Well, something tells me this doesn't really work. However, the poison dart frogs receive excellent protection, and most snakes do not risk messing with them. Most, but not all. Some predators have learned to resist toxins, such as the Erythrolampris epinephalus snake, whose name sounds like a spell from the Harry Potter saga. As a matter of fact, it seems evolution is more likely to give toxin immunity to predators rather than their prey. That's not fair. Or does it actually make sense? Okay, okay, of course, it does. Like most things evolution performs, predators who eat poisonous animals eventually stop perceiving them as something harmful. It's like with a hot sauce. The first time you eat it, it can make you cry and gasp for air. But if you eat it all the time, your body will adapt. I think this is how Erythalampris epinephalus learned to eat poison dart frogs. Poison dart frogs learn to eat poisonous insects. Well, you get the idea. When along with immunity to poison, you also get the poison itself, it's twice as good for the animal. The tiger keelback snake eats poisonous toads to protect itself from larger predators. I wouldn't be surprised if the toads steal their poison from some ants. Now imagine the tiger keelback snake attacking a human using ant toxin. This is some quality revenge plan. This is for the earth, humans! But snakes have an unexpected enemy the snakes themselves. Incredibly cool, dangerous, fast. Even they can sometimes miss and bite themselves instead of prey. Have you ever bitten your lip, cheek, or tongue while eating? This probably has happened to everyone. Now imagine your every bite was venomous. Doesn't sound nice. Apparently the snakes also realized this and they developed immunity to their own venom. They will not be affected by one accidental bite. They'll need to do this several times so that the injected venom would start causing trouble. The dose should be really immense. Many snakes of the same species can bite each other during contacts, and if evolution had not come up with a solution, we'd have no snakes at all. You may think all of these ways of confronting snakes are somehow too complicated and long. Some also involve the unavoidable death of many generations. So maybe there's a more pleasant option. After all, there are mongooses. Can't you just take them and, I don't know, extract a universal antidote from their blood that'll protect all people from snake bites forever? Unfortunately, mongooses are not going to share their secrets. Instead of anti-venom blood, mongooses possess mutations on their very cells that block snake neurotoxins, like a wad of gum in a keyhole. These mutations are not transferable to humans. Perhaps we could use genetic engineering to help, but then we should go all in. 
There are many other cool abilities that we could borrow from animals. The ability to blend in with the environment like chameleons, to see at night like cats. Someone might even want to communicate through ultrasound like whales. Though introducing changes in the human genes, especially adding something we borrowed from animals, is a very challenging and dangerous experiment, some scientists consider it unethical, and many countries actually prohibit gene editing. As a matter of fact, these fears are justifiable. We're talking about human embryos, and no one knows what the consequences will be. Maybe we'll make superhumans? Or maybe the test subjects will simply die. There are no guarantees. Even experiments on animals, which are considered successful, give rather strange results. I already mentioned spider goats in one of the videos, a unique product of genetic engineering, though they don't know how to weave webs or climb walls. To be honest, these goats look quite usual. Scientists simply took a gene that encodes silk and placed it among the DNA that prompts milk production. So if you milk a spider goat, you can get a lot of milk full of spider silk protein. Then the milky web. Damn, that sounds like nonsense. Nevertheless, they lift a fiber of spider silk out of the milk, spool it on a reel, and in the future, they hope to establish mass production. And this is a successful experiment we're talking about. Imagine if someone decided to mix the genes of human and electric eel but failed. They wanted to create electro but got this instead. Oh! Ouch! 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 Oh! Okay, I get it. We're not getting genetic immunity from the venom. What else can we use against snakes? Well, only turn into the snake itself. Well, or at least try to. The Mimic Octopus does a great job, depending on the situation. It can pretend to be the humble Soliectes heterorhinos fish or the yellow-lipped sea crite, a very venomous snake. The octopus sticks six legs into some hole, picks up the other two, and slowly moves them. It really looks like a sea crite. Who'd want to mess with a venomous snake? Even the snakes themselves don't want this. Yes, in theory, such a disguise would work against a real sea crite. Although cannibalism is common among many species, this does not mean that one snake instantly attacks another upon encounter. If the situation is not critical, and it's not about fighting for a female or prey, sea crites will most likely ignore each other. Other reptiles actually know how to make friends. Garter snakes not only seek out social contacts, but they also choose whom they socialize with. Scientists who studied their friendship separated the snakes that hang out together and then watched in amazement as they crawled back to their pals. They returned to their bros and did not want to socialize with new acquaintances. By the way, scientists have no idea what prompts the friendship of the garter snakes. This definitely has nothing to do with breeding. The research snakes did not prefer friends of the opposite sex, but on the other hand, snake friends usually join up together, which helps them keep warm and protect themselves from predators. <sighs> Of course, it all sounds very nice, but I completely forgot about the octopus. His disguise is flawless. But what if the sea crite attacks it anyway? Well, maybe the snake was having a bad day. You never know. Hard to say. I've not found an answer to this question, but I assume the sea crite will prevail. After all, it's very difficult to handle venom unless you're a wood rat. Actually, there are very few creatures that handle snakes but do not hunt them. Because snakes, well, let's be honest, snakes are pretty cool. Everyone wants to be a snake, even birds. Some of them, such as blue tits, emit amazing hiss-like sounds to scare away predators. Scientists even conducted an experiment on mice and found that tits really hiss just like snakes. The mice acted equally anxious in response to snake and tit hissing compared to the control sounds. But the tit hisses not only at predators, but at other birds as well. As it usually happens in the animal kingdom, birds constantly fight each other for convenient spots for nests. Imagine you noticed a great hollow where you can make a whole penthouse, and then another bird flies up to it. Just hiss at it. Yeah, it really works. Everyone's afraid of snakes. <laughs> Alas, everyone is afraid of snakes, except for the snakes themselves. What should small birds do then? They had to invent other sounds. They do not help against snakes, but most likely they help other birds. When they spot a snake or something that looks a lot like it, the Japanese tits start making special alarm calls. Apparently, these sounds are warning other animals around. Well, now you know how to say snake in the bird language. See you later.